Support Wrestle Talk. Donate on Patreon. Hello and welcome to Wrestle Ramble. This is Luke Owen. I'm Ollie Davis, and today we're going to be answering some of your questions, which includes how did we get to become wrestling fans? Should men fight women in wrestling? And how do you balance such a top tier of talent in WWE? How do you give everyone their dues? If you want to go to any of those discussions, click the timestamps in the video descriptions below or stay right here where we're going to dive right into our first question today which is one of those teased in the um in the opening bit there if you want to submit your own questions uh, please do email in to ollie at wrestletalk.tv that's o-l-i at wrestletalk.tv but pre-warning you we get a lot a lot of emails which is very nice mm -hmm. we do read them all we can't um unfortunately reply to all and we definitely can't get to them all on the podcast uh, but if uh, that there is um, a Patreon tier where if you give that amount, we will get to them. And that's what these guys have done. So cheers. Cheers. So the first one is from Matthew. Are you sure you want to do this? That's his wrestling nickname. His real name is Matthew Shaw. And he said, I could listen to you guys ramble for days. Uh, mine's a simple question. What got you guys into becoming wrestling fans? So what got us into professional wrestling? Uh, okay, so my uh, when I was a kid, um, probably about six or seven years old, maybe seven, uh, I once went down to my uh, local newsagents mm. with my pocket money mm. um, to go pick up my latest copy of Sonic the Comic, which is what I used to buy on a weekly basis with my pocket money. Um, but I didn't pick up a, a, a issue of Sonic the Comic that week, despite the fact that it was always brilliant. Um, in fact, there was something that caught my eye, and it was a WWF sticker book. Mm. And I, uh, pill, I, I was like, wow, what's this? And I went through, and then I recognised uh, the, the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, because my brother had a poster of the British Bulldog. I don't know why my brother had a poster of the British Bulldog, because he's never been into wrestling. Um, just likes his body. Just likes the British Bulldog, I guess. Um, and uh, then, so I, I, I took it, I, I got that, and I got some stickers, some packs of stickers to go in there, which probably cost me about 75p in total, I would mm. have thought, to get the whole lot. And I took it home, and then my mother found it. And my uh, mother was very much against uh, wrestling, mm. hated the idea of it. She was uh, the sort of parent that believed that if you did watch something like that, you would end up going and uh, trying to reenact it. I don't know why people would think that, because like, as kids, you don't join. No, I no, never, no, ever no. like pile drive Ross Powell. No, exactly. <laughs> that would be dangerous. No. I, mean, I would never, I would never take all the sofa cushions off oh, the sofa yeah. and lay them out and form a little mini ring no. and have a rumble with my friends around the house. No, I would never That's do anything insane. like that. I'd be insanity. Yeah, uh, I would never drag my mattress out into the back garden to practice doing uh, flip dives off the garage roof. Why would you? Why would you do why things would you like do that? that? No, no. Jeez. But anyway, so she. Uh, that's why I wasn't allowed to watch. Power Rangers. I, well, I, Power Rangers I watched in secret, but she wouldn't take me to go see the movie, so I never mm. got to see the movie when it came out in cinemas. Anyway, that's a long... But So, anyway, my mum took the... This is, this is Luke's therapy session. The <laughs> my mum took the sticker book back and got me my Sonic the Comic instead. She took it back? She took Had it she back. Had used any of the stickers? No, because she'd caught me before I'd even opened any ah. of them up, so she just took it back and swapped it over. Foreshadowing of the porn mag <laughs> ten years later, I bet. <laughs> Um, uh, but so like that kind of sort of started a bit of a, a bit of an obsession with it I had a, a VHS that mm. I used to watch uh, on the sly when my parents were out that I'd borrowed from a friend and it was another the, foreshadowing there was the it was the Battle Royal at the Royal Albert Hall which was okay. uh, set in London Davy Boy was obviously the big star then Hulk Hogan wasn't there because he was off doing movies uh, but the Legion of Doom were wrestling and I, and I found them cool and I thought the Nasty Boys were cool um, and then I also had Royal Rumble for the Mega Drive, mm. which was a great game. Not doesn't hold up very well going back to it twenty years later, but still it's a great game nonetheless. But when when I really got into wrestling, when I was actually watching it uh, on on the reg, uh, was late nineteen ninety nine. I think it was when I really started to to get into it, and that's because it started to come on Channel Four. Mm. So we were we got Sunday night heat every Sunday sure. at about four o'clock, so we could watch that, and we used to get pay per views, uh, four pay per views a year for free. So two thousand was the year I really, really got into wrestling, and then during that year, I then got into uh, tape trading. 
a lot uh, because a friend of mine was also into wrestling so he had loads of stuff on VHS we went back and watched all the old pay-per-views he had loads of Raw taped so we used to just spend like hours and days just sat there just like watching an episode of Raw that's finished put the next one on watching that and then he got into uh, tape trading for ECW stuff so we used to watch a lot of that not a lot of WCW not as much as I would have liked but we'd watch the bits and pieces but that's that's basically the story of how I got into professional wrestling I uh, yeah I I mean so my one is is Sky Sky 1 and Smackdown that it used to be uh, at 10am maybe 11am every Saturday morning Uh, I don't know when it was taped back then well, it was, was SmackDown a, a Thursday night. Yeah, it was show. a Thursday night show. Mm. Yeah, so we just we got it the Saturday after. Like, if I stayed at my friend's house because we never had Sky because Rupert Murdoch is the devil and I refused to give him any money, and as do my parents. Um, and uh, so, but my friends obviously had Sky because they're quite happy to fund the devil. Mm. So I used to go there around to their house and just you know, I wouldn't pay for it, but they I would get to watch SmackDown yeah, yeah. On, a, on a Saturday morning. Well, uh, we we uh, subscribe to a man's very ingenious business plan and revolutionised. <laughs> Uh, sports on television. Hey, or no, I mean, uh, full credit to him as a businessman, but um, he is the devil incarnate. And yeah, so, but the problem was, is that was right in the middle of the day. And I became quite adamant. I'm going to watch this. This is my thing. This is like my favourite thing in the world. Why would you, why would, I, I don't want to go to the shops. And you know, so it really limited what my family could do on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> because you know telly down- i didn't have a telly in my room it was telly downstairs i took over the entire lounge and my sister got into it for, for just like stockholm syndrome i think just because she was subjected to it so much and uh yeah so the parents didn't like that side of it that it was always um that that it dominated so much of the day off and then on saturday on sunday rather heat would be on channel four mm-hmm. and then sometimes i swear like thursday Wednesday, Channel 5 would have Thunder. They used to have WCW stuff on, yeah. yeah. That's right. I caught some WCW stuff, but obviously that was when the, the dark days of WCW. Yeah, I didn't know that. I just saw it was wrestling. I was like, what? These aren't the normal people. Is this another WWE show? No, it says WCW. Who's the cat? Who's, who's, this, who's this disco <laughs> the f- guy? The first uh, WCW guy I remember seeing on like one of those Channel 5 shows was uh, The Wall. It's, it's The Wall, brother. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, that was, but I, I've always had a bit of a chip on my shoulder because I don't have. I'm the oldest person in my family uh, across like the well, whole. And you mean your parents? As yeah, well. I'm older than my parents. <laughs> I was born at the dawn of time, <laughs> and it's weird, man. It's like just watch. I've been through so many loved ones dying. I was going to say, yeah, yeah it's you've, you've seen some things, man. Uh, so um, I'm the oldest one of all the kids in like my aunts and uncles and cousins. I'm the oldest cousin, and I'm older than my sister. So I've never had a big brother to go hey have you seen terminator ah have you seen rocky hey look at this wwf hulk hogan thing uh, i've had to discover all these things by myself whereas all my friends had the older brothers oh, and I, you know they always get the pass me downs of the cool toys and they'd always know uh, these whereas i came to things very very late uh, cool things like that at least ladies uh yes and <laughs> Uh, yeah, but that's uh, and my mum as well didn't like me watching it because she had a bad hip, and every t- like she didn't didn't mind wrestling, but if she if she saw someone fall over like I I can't look at needles, uh, I just wince away. It's like oh get it off the screen. So when they would land on their hips specifically or do like a what do you call them bottom bumps? Well, like a leg drop. Yeah, like a leg drop. Yeah, she would she would just be like oh oh get get it off the screen. So I couldn't really watch it around then. Again, she was stopped from coming in the room for entire Saturdays. <laughs> But yeah, that was how I got into it. It was just flicking through the channels and, and mm. really latching on and being like, well, that's in the golden era. Kurt Angle, Rock, uh, Triple H, I was, I, I Stone remember, Cold at that point before I, he was injured. I particularly remember going to... Um, it was, so it was 2000. It was Christmas 2000. My uh, folks and I and my older brother, we went to Disney World for mm. Christmas. And uh, we were staying in this hotel. And in the airport, I remember my uh, my parents allowing me to buy a wrestling magazine. Ooh. And obviously, it was like one of those like year in review ones. And it covered all the stuff like WCW and ECW and stuff. Oh, like, not an official one. No, not an official one. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. So yeah, um, of course. Uh, what's it's been like, these Power Slam? Yeah, it was like Power uh, Slam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. God, I just remember being like just it was like, mesmerized by the whole thing, and it just made me love it even more. Well, that's it. Because back then, before the internet, I had no idea what was going on. And I was a kid as well, so I had like no experience, didn't ha- didn't know how the wrestling industry worked. And then you get this this like power slam, 
and you're like, what? Where are all these shows? These are, are these all WWF shows? Yeah, I was very confused. I didn't know like like how like what's a house show? Yeah. You mean they do shows that aren't on telly? But who wins those? Yeah, and I I wasn't sure if it was real or not. But like I kind of like sat Santa Claus, mm. Father Christmas, who is real. Uh, <laughs> I was kind of like, is it real? And I'd have really long discussions, but but like how can they not get her? Mm. And then someone would be going, no, it's totally real. It's totally real. It's all legit, man. And then another friend would be going, no, it's not. It's choreographed. The, the ring is made of foam. They don't get hurt at all. <laughs> it's a big old it's trampoline. All fake blood. The chairs are made of yeah. lycra. I don't know. <laughs> Do you ever have that discussion when you were at school when like, the, the first time you discovered ECW or those words, they were like mystical words yeah. around the playground. No, we didn't, have, we didn't have ECW. Oh, no, we had like, uh, so ECW were like mystical words because that was like the older kids were like, that's real. Yeah. Like that WWF stuff, that's all fake. Like that's just that's that's fake. But ECW, that's real. Oh, they're, they're, that's like they're like real fights. I think I do remember a conflict because I had the ECW game. And yes, I was like, Anarchy this Rules. Is rubbish. Oh, it's great. It's, I it's, know, built, it's built on the Attitude um, in my, uh, engine. But in my, it was it just felt so bare compared oh, yeah. to the other ones. When I say I it's played. great, it is actually crap. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, like I was like, but what is ECW? And then like, it's like like MMA. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, uh, and, and there was I a, feel weird about this now, especially around that time as well, because there was also the. Uh, do you remember bum fights? That yes. was a thing in yes. two thousand as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there was this big like underground movement of bum fights. Was this collection of people who used to I pay used to, used to pay homeless people to fight each other, and they would oh. film it and then just and sell it. And I, I my friend of mine had tapes, and I bought a tape myself. Mm. I bought it off a very you know of early days eBay. I bought a, a bum fights thing. And uh, yeah, I, that's what I thought ECW was before I eventually saw it. Yeah, you know when you watch things and it makes you feel a bit ill inside. That, that's what bum fights used to do. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, this is just rotten. Even <laughs> at that age, when I didn't know what morals were. So next up, and or unless you have anything more. No, so, but it was quite fun going back through my uh, my uh, my teenage years a and journey through a journey Luke through time. time. Next up with gravestone Gary Hawkin. Ooh. Who do you think is the best British wrestler, current or past, in the WWE? And who do you think could make it in the WWE who isn't there now? I always think that William Steve Regal was William Regal, but Steve Regal uh, was underrated and could have had a good run as a top heel. And I'd also love to see Bram have a run in the WWE. Though I don't think Bram Bram's not English, is he? I honestly don't know. I don't. I don't know that. I'm going to assume could... he is because Gravestone has put him down. Yes, but I, I, I'm not aware um, uh, whether he is or not. So, greatest British wrestler in WWE, current or past? So, okay. So, is the question who do you think is the best? <laughs> there's current... two. There's two. There questions. is, and and who do you think could have made it? Who isn't there now? Okay, because I actually kind of answered the other question. I, I answered both questions, but the wrong way around. Sure. Um, but who is the great, the best British wrestler? I mean, I'm a big Davy Boy fan. It, it I, would have to be right. I love the British Bulldog. Yeah. I thought the British Bulldog was just the coolest dude. Ever since you saw it up on your brother's wall. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I just thought he was a badass. You know, I've got mm. a. a, a bulldog t-shirt very I, and it's it's sad as well because when you watch like the bulldog's last run in the wwf mm. like that 1999 period it's sad man because this is not this is not SummerSlam 92 bulldog this is i've had my back busted up by the uh the ultimate warriors gimmick yeah. stage in wcw bulldog and it's just a bit sad but yeah i mean so I, I think i'd go with the bulldog but i was also a big fan of william regal that's Hate, it, isn't it? hated hated yeah. him when i was a kid because because like he's a heel so of yeah. course I hated him and he always cheated to win and then he just started going away but now watching it like through adult eyes and you see how good like he's such a natural in backstage mm. areas he had a moment on NXT TV last week I think it was last week's show anyway I was watching you here and I nearly rewound it and called you in because I think you were recording the news because they just like cut backstage and William Regal's just looking off camera talking to the cameraman before someone sort of walks in to be like hey stand you know stand next to them mm. but like away from them be like hey so my full body is facing, sure. the, facing the screen and he's just talking off he's like and they had to give her 12 stitches it was unbelievable you've never seen anything like it <laughs> and he was just like I, and when I was watching he was like I can imagine William Regal went through about 30 different lines there before like, yeah. they used that one we used that one <laughs> Uh, I I would uh, of course Davy Boy is the big one. I don't think it's that really up for question. But I did love William Regal as a kid. I liked him as a kid, mm. and when I I would see him on Heat, that's how I was exposed to him most. <clears throat> 
but I just I just loved the uh, the regal stretch. Yeah. I was really into submission based stuff when I was a kid, like the Benoit, um, the Cripple Across Face, and the Walls of Jericho. I loved the submission. Yeah, sorry. I mean, also his 2001 stuff he was doing with Tajiri as yes, his, yeah, as his assistant. Course. God, that's funny. It's so funny. Yeah, it's a shame that he uh, his was it his steroids he got done for the wellness yeah, but that policy. was that was before what? that was before all that. So like he came into the WWF as the real man's <laughs> man. Um, which is like an, still an amazing entrance music. He's a, a man, man, such a, a man. man, and that's when he had his real bad drug issues. And but as the King of the Ring later on in the noughties. Yeah, I think by the time he came back, um, so in that two thousand role, I think that's when he'd cleaned himself up. And that's I th- I'm pretty sure I might have my timelines wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's when he sorted himself out. Um, and that's that was almost his second chance uh, mm. at at a WWF run. Uh, as as far as people uh, who could make it in the WWE who aren't there now, um, of course, there's I mean there's so many people right now who who UK is so good. Zack Sabre Jr. has been there. I'm a huge Marty Skell fan. He's so good. So it's gonna be Marty for me. I but I'm the, the only it's thing I'm worried well. about. I'm not, hardly, <laughs> hardly. I can go up to Marty and go hi Marty, and he looks at me and he goes, oh yeah yeah Ollie. <laughs> I would say I mean I'm like oh, he still remembers me. But I would hardly say we're friends. I mean I, I would like to think we're friends. I won't be so bold. But uh, he's just he's, he's my favorite wrestler working today. I just everything he does. You know when you get excited for little bits that people do in matches. Mm-hmm. I don't care if it's the same match. I just want to see those same spots done over and over again. Sorry, just kidding. Yeah. Super kick, uh, chicken wing. My only worry is what they would do to him in WWE and how they would change his gimmick. Yeah, I was going to say, because he couldn't come in with the same villain character. Or if he did, it would be like a watered-down WWE yeah. version of it, where like they would... What WWE tends to do is they like they bring a gimmick in, but sort of focus on the wrong thing. Mm. So they would like focus on the death mask or the, the Plagueis mask and be like, "Oh, okay, that's the thing." Then let's make it all about this. So that's a character. Now you're a supernatural. Yeah. Thing. Now you're that's the character that you're playing. When you put this on, you're a different person, and that's mm. what they would focus on rather than being like, "No, no, it's just a cool thing I wear to the ring." Yeah, uh, but of course, I mean, I used to love Doug Williams. Oh back man, in the, uh, yeah. The, before he went to TNA and then in the TNA bits. Yeah, his uh, FWA was days was... I used to love uh, yeah, Doug Williams. The, um, I mean, man, just like the rolling German The suplex. Chaos Theory. Oh, yeah. So it's good. A wicked finisher. Uh, actually, a guy in <laughs> WWE that I thought was going to do amazing stuff, but really didn't, was Paul Burchill. Yeah, that's another I one. Th- I thought Burchill was going to... Because he was brilliant. Like, the, the top rope C4 thing was just like... It's, it's just incredible stuff. You're like, mm. oh my God, this that move is just going to get so over in WWE. But they got in... Didn't really know what to do with him. Saddled him with a pirate gimmick. I mean, that that's a hilarious story in itself. That Vince yeah. McMahon was like, "Oh, this Pirates of the Caribbean's popular. Do, uh, make it, give me a pirate character." So they got him it's to just do the time in. They got him to do the character, and then when he did it, Vince McMahon was like, "What's this?" Because Vince hadn't seen Pirates of the Caribbean. He just ah. heard it was popular, but didn't know what the character was. So he's there doing d- the Johnny Depp thing. He's like, "What the hell? That's not a pirate. What mm. the hell is he doing?" And then that was it. He was done for. He was buried after that. Um, it's a shame as well, and they tried to do the um, the incest angle with him and uh, Kate Lee, but Kate Lee Birch, yeah, yeah, which didn't go out over either. No. But do you know who is a, a, a British talent that I would have loved to have seen, really given a chance up on a, on a big stage, who I really feel like he got some amazing stuff and he made a real good career for himself. Jody Fleisch mm. would have loved to have seen, like Jody Fleisch would have been awesome in yeah. like the WCW cruiserweight stuff, and Jody and Johnny Storm, and who Johnny Storm incredibly well. I was going to say like those two, like that that's a match. Like I, I love two wrestlers that have that match mm. that they just have a match that they just tour around the world incredible yeah. and you book people to have that match it was the the uh, Guerrero Malenko you wouldn't just book Guerrero or Malenko you're like no I'm booking both of those because yeah. I want to book that match onto my show because that will sell me tickets I'm pretty sure it's Jody one of the worst botches I've oh, ever seen oh no it is Jody it's I Jody. know it's anything where he hits his face into the oh. yeah so it's a shooting star press off of the top rope to the outside Somehow he completely misses the guy and he lands face first onto one of the steel steps, which is the entrance to the, oh the my ring. God, it's so brutal. It is, it is. It's in the British Wrestling horrible. Weekly thing. It's isn't in it? the yeah. Don't Try This at, at home. home. Yeah. And so I have to, I wince every time still I watch it. Oh, yeah. But I've, I've saw Jody a couple of times um, down in FWA mm. and um, yeah, I just thought he was brilliant. 
Absolutely loved him. But there's so there's so many people. Wade Barrett could have been incredible yeah. if they gave him the proper push. Yeah, really, really. Uh, like if he if that Nexus angle was done right, or even if they gave him a better run with the uh, bad news Barrett stuff, mm. that could have been great. Um, he said you oh British. So I love Sheamus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't say he's the best British wrestler there, uh, but. But yes, yes. So those uh, are mine. yeah, some good uh, other good British talent to look into. Um, uh, Robbie X, who I mentioned on the the show the other day, and um, Justin Seismer is Seism. Is, Seism, sorry, I keep, I keep calling him Seismer, and I don't know why. But the Hammer, he has just got such a great look, and he's so young that he can oh, man like he's got so much talent to, to bring to this world. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and but there's so the UK scene is incredibly good right now. So apologies if we have missed. <laughs> That we could have like just listed a I could have say yeah run off a list of about 40 names RJ there. saying another one yeah so next up we have a question from Hard as Nails Nick Schiff now this is a long one and I'm going to take you on the journey because it's quite an interesting one and it does give some context to the the uh, the ending question thanks to the WWE Network I have been able to watch the glory days of then WWF and relive all these classic moments that I once never saw before I became a fan in 2010 so I have had a lot of storylines and feuds I never knew once happened to catch up on just finished Wrestlemania 2000 sorry for that on the other hand, my lady partner has been a fan since her childhood and watched Raw when it was happening in real time. When I watch the old episodes, it gives her some nostalgia when watching and reminiscing over some of her favourite memories. This leads to a heated debate about women's wrestling. She loves how involved China used to be in men's storylines and even at one point capturing the Intercontinental Belt, which was a huge milestone at the time. Spoiler, she did it twice. With women, yeah, poor, poor Gary there. It was Gary, wasn't it? No, it's Nick Schiff. Uh, with women's wrestling today being some of the best ever seen in WWE, she believes the company would be should be interweaving women and men's storylines like they once did in the past, with China and even Lita in the 2000s. Her flagship for this is Charlotte Flair, as the woman to rise above the ranks. She could be seen as the most athletic and believable to take on the men. Nia Jax has proven nothing to either of us besides her size. Personally, I find that this scenario could not happen in today's WWE because of their current storylines and PG format compared to how they used to book China initially against the men. Jeff Jarrett, anyone? So I leave it to you and Luke with your side of the debate. Do you guys believe that one day someone like Charlotte could wrestle a man and win their belt? Or is it just a fantasy with today's WWE hierarchy disapproving of this concept? We'd both love to hear your thoughts. This is a really interesting one because I can see See, oh, you just kicked my. Oh, did I? Yeah, you did. I hardly touched it. I know. Well, you you did kick it. But for everyone who <laughs> that that means nothing to either podcast or video listeners, I touched the cable with my foot, and it knocks out the sound in my headphones, so I can't hear myself. Um, I can see both sides of this debate. So. On the one hand, like when Lucha Underground do it, I think it's great. I think that people like Sexy Star are really, really good. And I like seeing their matches. There was, um, uh, when you had, uh, I think it was Sexy Star who won the, uh, the yes, championship. Yes. And uh, she was then going up against um, uh, Cueto, Davio Cueto. And it was like, oh man, because he's just like this big, big. Davio Cueto no, the authority figure. You're I thinking thought, of. He was, the, he, was the, he was the champion yeah. at the end of season one. It's not Penta. It's it's not Penta. Um, it's just carry on. Yeah, just carry on. But anyway, he used to like sit up on a throne. It was like a Mortal Kombat villain. Yeah, it was yeah. brilliant. But anyway, it was and it was him. And the match was just it was just like you know just throwing her around like an absolute ragdoll because she's what was she you know she's five foot nothing and just mm. throws her around. And I thought the match was actually quite good. And I was I've got, I really got into it because I bought into her, her character. I'm pretty sure it was Sexy Star at the time as well. It might have been someone else. But anyway, regardless, I might begin. I haven't seen it in a while. And. Um, but you listen to a review, someone like uh, Brian Alvarez and uh, Vincent Verhey over at Figure Four slash Resting Observer, when they were reviewing it, they were like, I just felt really uncomfortable watching it because I'm just watching this this very, this very 100 pound soaking wet woman just being ragdolled around and just being like her face being stood like stamped into by this mm. much larger man. And it's very uncomfortable to watch. So I do I do see both sides of the argument. <clears throat> The China one, I think, is very interesting because at the time you could tell that no one wanted to do it. Uh, China was really pushing for it. She really wanted to do it. But everyone in the back really didn't want them to do it because they didn't they didn't buy into women 
fighting men. There were a lot of guys who were very uncomfortable uh, putting her over because it ma- they thought it made them look weak. Jim Ross on commentary, if you go back and listen to him, he is constantly burying like the idea of it, just going like, "I don't believe, I don't buy it, I just don't believe it." And it's like, "Oh my god, all right, like you're meant to like, I know you don't believe it, but look, put your personal feelings aside and just focus on it." Do you know what he always used to do about this? Going back and watching old pay per views, he has such a thing in it. He has such a such a thing in for Billy Gunn because he wears earrings. <laughs> it's just like he's wearing an earring. I just think that's really disrespectful. <laughs> so why is he wearing an earring? I have to wear an earring. It's for, as for ladies, that's what women do. He's pro- poor JR probably had a really bad experience with an earring, and he's just he's seen it. It's triggered him. Mm. Um, so yeah, I can see both sides of the argument. I don't see WWE doing it anytime soon. Um, Unless it was someone like a Nia Jax. Like, it would never be an Alexa Bliss. It would never be a Sasha Banks or a Bailey. But it would be someone like... Uh, and the reason why China was put in there is because she was huge and she was a, she was a bodybuilder. Dana Brooke possibly could be that decision, but she's, she's like five foot nothing herself. So, again, that's like... As soon as you put her into the ring with someone who's six foot, it just looks ridiculous. I tell you how you could do it. You could have, like, a, a Sasha Banks against an, a heel manager, Enzo Amore. That's where, a, where there's yeah. not much physicality at all. It's just like a slap. Enzo wouldn't get any... in this just... For example, Enzo wouldn't get any offense in, and Banks would make him tap. Yeah, it's like that, the, that's fine. The uh, they did it in ECW with uh, Foz, uh, Fonzie sure. against uh, Francine. It's like you know this big bloody brawl, and it was <laughs> it's marvelous. But it, it it's it's a it, um, I want to say gimmick because that makes it sound like it's awful. But that's what it was. It was it was yeah. a, a gimmick match. So the uh, so for the Lucha Underground case, that works I think because. Uh, it's it's such a fantastic world. People fly, people teleport. You've got genuine undead wrestlers. So the and, and monsters who eat people behind chains. It's a comic book. Matanza. Was so, it Matanza? Was that um, Matanza? Matanza. Yeah, yeah, Matanza. Yeah. Uh, so it's like a comic book. So it's like it's like saying, oh, I don't believe uh, Miss Marvel couldn't beat up Captain America. Yeah. When, when you know they're both people with superpowers, they could do. So the the. The intergender stuff in Neutral Underground, I've got no problem with because it's woven into the fabric of the concept. Uh, but people obviously do get a bit like they, they they do recoil when they see a man beating up a woman, even if it's all fictional. Mm. Um, I d- I don't have any problem with it because I I know it's fake. Uh, not it, for, it, you, fake predetermined. You, yeah. you know that the, the lady is part of this. Yes. She's not. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's consensual pretend beating up. Uh, just like how in a film, if a man was to be violent against a woman in a film, and that was used to show how the man is a bad person, like I'm like, oh okay, this is servicing the story. Like, just having women involved in violence from men isn't exploitative. It's it's a story. It can be a sto- it can be exploitative. I'm not saying it can't. It was with China. Yeah, uh, but it's it's about whether it services a larger story. But that's that. And so Lucha Underground is contained in its own fictional world. Where it comes a problem for me, someone who doesn't find uh, men and women fighting as off-putting morally or in my stomach, and I, I don't mind if you do think that, I know a lot of people do, mine comes from a believability perspective. That's it. Uh, and I, so I only found this out a few months ago, how... So Serena, Will- I'm going to use the Serena Williams example. No, okay. So I know you. I thought you might use this, but mm. is this fact? Yes. Because there are two. It's on Wikipedia. Well, I was going to say. Well, I was going to say because there are two sides to this. Yes. There is the story that you're going to tell, and there's the other side of it, which is the match never happened, but it was a John McEnroe rant about it, saying that if that would happen, she wouldn't be able to beat uh, uh, whichever the, the, the rank it was. Well, this match did happen. So okay, so that's what I'm saying is because yeah. like I've because I relayed that story onto my lady partner. She said that it actually never took place. It was just a John McEnroe rant. No, this is uh... <laughs> the so here we go. Battle of the Sexes, tennis. So I'm reading Wikipedia is my source, mm-hmm. so, and this is back in 1998. Uh, the Williams is still, of course, very proficient at tennis. I don't know if they're more so now than they used to. So uh, this was. The, the Williams sister says, we're so good, we could be anyone outside the top 200 players in the world. And someone who was ranked, let me get this, uh, 203, who was a fellow by the name of Carsten Brash. I don't know where he's from. He challenged them both 
And um, he, so this one journalist described him as a man whose training regime centered around a pack of cigarettes and more than a couple of b bottles of ice cold lager. So matches took place in Melbourne for the Australian Open. Brash had just finished a round of golf and two beers. He first took on Serena and uh, beat her 6-1 in a game. And then Venus walked on court and Brash won 6-2. Okay, so, so that's fine. I, yeah. I, I just wanted to clarify because I've heard both. I've heard both arguments. Oh, that, but that's the the actual one. So really, I never knew the. I thought like oh, top women, top female tennis player in the world, she would, you know, probably be able to take on the number fifteen, right? I had no idea the actual golf in biology was that huge, uh, for it to not even the the top two hundred. I don't know if that's the same as now. This is nineteen ninety eight, of course. But you'd imagine for fighting where it's a lot more down to the muscular you know, blah, blah, blah. I was it would say, be like, even it, more dominant yeah I mean I, I mean, I don't want to be that guy but say like if you put Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor inside the octagon but it's, would it would would that be considered a fair fight yeah it's I mean, not even that on, it's like on weight classes I suppose like Ronda Rousey like in her similar weight class what level of MMA fighter in the world would she have to go up against it's that so I, I don't know but it's it's not so it it doesn't make sense from a believability perspective. That's why I struggle with it. Uh, of course, you can make the argument that WWE is a fantastical place where you play characters. You've got the you did have the Undertaker walking around. I'm sure Kane's going to come back at some point. But yes, overall, as a rule, I prefer my wrestling to be more reality based, and it doesn't just it doesn't quite fit with me. For me, it, it's it's a case of the believability thing does come into it, and like I like to. When I enjoy WWE most when uh, I treat it like it is a sporting contest. Mm. Um, and that's why I like Brock Lesnar so much. He feels like he is a real fighter going into these these fights. They are predetermined. And whenever, because like, I've, I've said this enough times, and people have said, like, people who hate Brock Lesnar, like, well, just watch UFC then. I don't like watching UFC. I find it really boring. Because UFC is, it, like, with WWE, it's all about the pomp and circumstance, the pyro and ballyhoo. So I, I, when I do try and keep it as a, or treat it as a sporting contest, and within the sporting world, men and women matches are kept separate. Mm. So if WWE followed that format as well, that's fine with me. But I, you know, as I said, I really enjoy uh, man v women matches in shows like Lucha Underground and ones that I've seen around the world. But actually, you know, ones I've seen in the past, so Lita and Dean Malenko. They had a match on Raw back in two thousand, late two thousand, and it was it was great. You know, it's it's really enjoyable mm. it's, because Lita can just sort of fly around, and Dean's they're about the same height, so it, it kind of works. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a height thing. That's what I said. Like Alexa Bliss at five foot nothing is going to look ridiculous when she stands in the ring with someone who's even who's even just like five foot ten who's the same height as me well i, I just to, to clarify my comments i'm not saying you can't have it ever no i'm just exactly. saying that you do need to work that into the story and the angle being told so it would have to be against the and manager or a guy would have to have an injury and usually when they do work it into a storyline it's for all the wrong reasons yeah. and i don't think i would trust mm. wwe writers That's a very good point i would never trust wwe writers to book that storyline i just don't think they be able to do it because when they do it they do what they did with Jeff Jarrett which is when he would just come out and roar every week kind of like women should be barefoot and pregnant I hate women mm. and then trying to come down and beat him up and then it leads to a good housekeeping keeping match yeah it's like uh, you wouldn't really trust WWE to book a sensitive foreign heel <laughs> no. so you probably shouldn't I, do it I for any other I wouldn't trust them to, to, to book an LGBTQ character no. like I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to trust them to do it no uh, do you remember when Stephanie said that? We're going to really focus on LGBT characters. I was like, oh, God. Oh God yeah. This is going to be so... <laughs> so. What's the word? Like, uh, just stereotypes. Just, I think and... it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. I just wonder if, like, the Velveteen Dream is their attempt at it. Hey, well, if it comes out that he's a gay character and they never mentioned it, you're like, oh, actually, that's quite progressive. <laughs> well done, WWE. Uh, and finally, from Rollable Rocco Beverlock... That's how I'm pronouncing it. I don't care. Locking in the Bever Lock. They, he says, if all the stars deserving to be on top of the WWE were actually treated like top stars, would there or would there not be a lot of balancing problems? There are only two main event titles and the US Intercontinental titles far below, it seems. So how could they pay all their due respects to each star? Not everyone 
can be champion at once. Now I'm going to hand this over to you because you said you had quite a lot to say about this. I have I have some thoughts of my own, but I wonder if they're going to be similar to yours. I don't know if it's uh, it's quite a lot. It's just I'm very I I feel quite strongly that the idea that everyone should be a champion is very very wrong that's that was pretty much my post well someone actually got in touch with me on twitter today saying like with all of these like great uh characters we've got at the moment these great wrestlers do you mm. think they should uh, introduce more titles and i'm like what would be the point like mm. it just it just by by introducing more titles it devalues every other title that's on there um and and yeah i agree with you it's just that i just just book people into to feuds yeah that it doesn't have to be for a title it's it's like so sometimes like if you think back to the 80s and the, and the 90s where wrestling was booked a lot more logically well WWE was uh, r- roughly and you think Roddy Piper never had a championship mm-hmm. uh million dollar man never had a championship yes he did he was world champion was it oh but then he was that by a no i'm pretty no i'm pretty sure DBS? okay maybe but there, there are there are, like, Owen Jake Hart, the snake Jake the snake was Jake Owen snake. Hart was Owen now Hart. and you're like oh my god those that's how prestigious the WWF title was because Hulk Hogan would hold it for years and years. So you, you really... So I'm trying to think, like, when people talk about Rusev and, like, Rusev, come on, he could be a world champion. I'm like, I love Rusev and I want Rusev to be really suddenly pushed. But and based on what I've seen so far, I'm not thinking... in my pre- If I was in control of WWE, I'm not thinking I'll put my WWE championship on Rusev because he's good. I would put my championship on who would be the top drawing money person. And I don't really see money in Rusev. I just see a really, really good, solid, uh, upper mid, lower top card talent. So that means if you just keep the belt on these mega, mega stars, when that belt's defended, people are like, oh, holy hell, this is a big deal. I'm going to tune in for this one. That's why Brock Lesnar feels massive. Uh, you d- there, to be honest, for me, there's no one else on that level now uh Goldberg when he came back he felt on that level because he was similarly treated but back in the classic John Cena does that's uh, actually one um but he's overexposed but back in the day Austin Rock I mean Mankind got kind of a token one um but re- if you just keep it on just a top that your mega mega money people and you go through challenges like Rusev could be an excellent challenger for two months a two month feud and then he goes goes back down into a number one contenders fight or maybe an intercontinental title feud do it that way but yeah the 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 mindset that oh uh so and so's been with the company cesaro's been with the company for ages or kofi's a good example a lot of people say about kofi like he should be a grand slam champion uh because he's won all these things he's been with the company forever he just why not why not give him just a world championship run like but you don't want to be handing these things out Mm -hmm. it's again i said it the other day you People like wrestlers deserve the respect, but not everyone is world championship material. I completely agree with you, and I like actually I think it's my biggest criticism I have with WWE at present. And I'm looking at this from a city from a SmackDown side of things. With SmackDown, they are very bad at creating storylines outside of titles mm. so like the randy orton rusev is a great example they were like okay so we're gonna have randy orton versus rusev at SummerSlam. uh what's the build for this we haven't had one because we've been putting time onto the the world championship and we've been putting time onto the u.s championship and we've been putting time onto the women's championship the women's division is, is beyond the worst for it if you are not going for the women's belt, you're not allowed a storyline. Mm. And that's where my issue lies. Because you can just have feud. I wanted them to do, um, I think I said Becky Lynch versus Charlotte at SummerSlam. I thought it would have been a, a, a great match. Another match. Oh, no, you, okay, another match. But I would have rather had like that match on the card than, say, you know, just uh, 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 any other, you know, maybe one of the other matches. You could have taken Big Cass off. But mm. I suppose you. But the point I'm making is that it's. It just seems silly that you they only seem to write storylines around people who are going for belts. That's where the problem lies for me. Tag, you know, the tag team division is the same thing. Mm. Yeah, so... And if you think... Because the larger bit of this question is if all the stars deserving to be at the top of WWE were treated fairly, so you're thinking, like, uh, your you Rusev's, your Cesaro's... Your Bobby Roode's. Your Bobby Roode's. Like, you're thinking... Ah, so if all those good people will move to the top, like, you know, how quality floats to the top, actually, that's probably enough for two whole brands there. Mm-hmm. And then all the other people who aren't really connecting uh, would go down. 
holy, holy moly, that is an amazing roster. Because WWE have an incredible roster mm -hmm. of talent. Unfortunately, they're not really allowed to show how good they are in the style of matches that WWE makes them put on. I mentioned the, the um, Armageddon Hell in a Cell earlier. And you actually you look at the star power that's in mm. that match, and not every one of those was a champion. Like you know, at the at the same time, because they only had the one belt, it was just the WWF title. And you had Kurt Angle going in as champion, but he was going against The Rock, Steve Austin, Triple H, The Undertaker, wow. and R Rikishi. Rikishi. But Rikishi they tried. But Rikishi, they were trying. They were they were trying to push him, but they just did an awful job. Cause he mm. lost his first two pay per view matches and barely got any offense in either one of them. But like even that that first five. Those are five top, top guys. All-timers. All, exactly. And all of those five, whether, uh, if they weren't facing Kurt Angle, mm. they were in their own matches. They were in their own feuds. Like the uh, Triple H would be feuding with Kurt Angle before mm. Kurt Angle was champion. And The Rock would be feuding with Chris Benoit, who were they, try they were trying to push up into the, uh, the upper limit. Then Steve Austin would be feuding with Triple H, not for the championship. They would just be in a real blood feud. It can be done. That, that's the other thing that's been lost, actually, because like blood feuds have been lost. But number one, contender feuds have been lost as yes. well. Like you'll just have a whole match on a pay-per-view dedicated to who's going to get the next title shot. But because WWE is this horrible rematch clause if you lose the belt and, and they just string out feuds forever using the same repetitive match, you don't get those ones because that means the next pay-per-view really should be the number one contender getting yeah. a shot. Yeah, actually, I mean, if you look Championship at... Championship opportunity. If you look at the, the main events of um, 2000, I'm going to use that as an example... And I'm just thinking this off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure every single one of those features a different person, with the exception of Royal Rumble and No Way Out, which was both Triple H versus mm -hmm. Cactus Jack. I'm pretty sure that's the only repeated main event throughout 2000. It's really interesting. And that's weird. Like, and there were uh, three or four different guys as champion. Uh, three. It was Triple H, Rock, and um, Kurt Angle were the only three champions that year. And there was always a different match every single um, mm -hmm. pay per view. And it was always like a really big. Oh man, I can't believe this is the main event. This is going to be great. Yeah. And it was always, with, and that's, you know, you're not even including guys like Kane in there, who at the time everyone was like, Kane's, Kane's going to be world champion mm. at some point because he's, he's an absolute, he's an unstoppable monster. Well, I hope that answered your question, Rocco. But that's I, all I, we've I, got time for. I felt we answered that question better than the women's one, but yeah. Yes, cool. Uh, that's all we've got time for, so please do click the videos that have just appeared over Luke's face to catch up with the latest WrestleTalk news or Wrestle Ramble. Press subscribe, support WrestleTalk on Patreon. This has been Luke Owen, I've been Ollie Davis, and that was Rambling.